special edition of The Well today, and I want to introduce you to the topic of some of the crisis that's going on in the education realm. Today we have with us Greg Bagby, technical support director <laughs> at, um, at the Hamilton County Central Office. Yes. Welcome. We have his lovely wife, Amy Bagby, who is a professor, Dr. Amy Bagby, a professor at Covenant College, and Cindy Gaston, who is at CSLA. And you've been there maybe three decades. Almost. 24 yes. years total. Yeah. So, I found it a little bit surprising in the recent months that we've talked a lot about um, what is happening in the medical community as a result of the pandemic and that we're hearing it's specifically nurses um, who are leaving the profession because it's been so stressful and they've gone through certain levels of trauma and it's been difficult for them. What I intuitively anticipated was that teachers were right there um, <laughs> in the hardship of it all, but it wasn't until probably November, December that I heard that there is a recent survey that's come out saying that 48% of teachers are considering leaving their field and that more than ever, teachers are not um, con thinking about returning or going into the field for a career. So I want us to talk about it, okay? Um, and I would just love to hear from all three of you, what do you think the issues are? What, what have you personally experienced that would say, I get it, I, I see why this is happening? Well, um, just my two cents. Uh, the whole idea, of, well, idea. <laughs> the pandemic hit at a horrible time for teachers in the sense of, <laughs> We were gearing up, of course, it was the second semester. Some folks were on spring break, some folks were ready for spring break. And a lot of schools and a lot of districts weren't prepared with devices. They didn't have a, the technology to move forward. Uh, thankfully, my district had bought most of the devices for the middle school and high school students, and we just needed some for elementary, but a lot of schools and a lot of districts were not prepared mm. and teachers were made to uh, build bricks without straw. Um, no, they were made to create lessons on the fly while their students were at home not being able to see the students and being able to and having to figure out ways to not only teach the students but assess the students and then we realized that oh yeah schools that's where most of the students eat so we need to feed the students and mm. uh, we're, we're trying to do lots more things to care for students. Uh, here in where we are in Chattanooga, two years ago, as you remember, after the pandemic hit, we had a tornado today, oh, two years yes. ago today. Was that? And uh, it was just another, I don't know, thorn in the side of everything that was going great. Um, and teachers are at the point that, of course, teachers were respected. Uh, I couldn't believe the respect that was coming out for teachers. Uh, the month of uh, late April and early May of 2020 because parents had to deal with the kids at home and they were saying lots of great things about teachers and then, <laughs> and then it turned immediately it seemed in August all the all the uh, teacher hype and everything that we were receiving kind of faded away because oh no the kids have to be back you have to be open because I need to say my I don't care about no mask no mask I don't know my kids need to be with you and it's one of those things where teachers didn't feel that they were a part of the situation or solution rather uh, I, many of them felt oh you're gonna throw kids in the room with me okay they're gonna kill me let's and, and it's just one of those stressors that no one ever anticipated Absolutely. that we're gonna be in a room full of kids and I'm thinking I could die at any moment because we didn't know. Yeah. So, two cents. <laughs> well, and I think that this this school year, we thought things were gonna be more back to normal. It felt like, last summer, it felt like the numbers were down and we'd be going back to school in person and everybody would be there and it would, you know, we kind of did what we had to do for that year and survived it and then everything would be back to normal and then it just wasn't. Everything, the, the kids being quarantined constantly, um, 
teachers, one of the main stressors we had last fall was just there'd be five kids quarantined from your class. And then the next day, you know, one would come back and two more would leave. And then a couple would come back and more would leave. And so there's this revolving door of kids that are home for yeah. five or 10 days yeah, right. and trying to keep up with everybody's learning when they're that inconsistent. Mm -hmm. And the was teachers really hard. are their own revolving And then we're all getting, right? we're getting sick too. We couldn't mm -hmm. find subs. In, in January, February this year, it, the sub situation was just terrible. You, we were, there was, there just weren't enough adults to, do what needed to be done in the schools with kids. I imagine that's incredibly frustrating. Amy, what were you seeing on the college level? I, I feel like in some ways we were shielded a bit because the focus on student learning shifts in higher ed from being as much the teacher's responsibility to more of the student's responsibility. Mm. So it was easier for us to say, here's what you got, figure it out. Whereas at the K-12 level, that can't happen. Mm -hmm. So it was still very stressful. We were, things were changing very quickly. We felt as though we were building the plane as we were flying it. So first everyone was sent home, then we're back, but we're masked, we're distanced. So only half my students could fit in the classroom, which right. meant I had to create a rotating schedule for who was there when I had, I had students joining virtually while also having students in the classroom. It just created, it, 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 it sort of bifurcated your attention. Mm -hmm. You had to pay attention to the people in the classroom, but you also had this whole group of students on the screen. And trying to pay attention to both groups at the same time is virtually impossible. Mm -hmm. And then the high absences, and so you're dealing with work coming in at odd times, and there was just so much to be paying attention to. Yeah. And yet, I could also recognize that my students were adults and it was really on them mm -hmm. to communicate well and to make sure that they were getting what they needed. Mm -hmm. That's totally different in the K-12 realm mm -hmm. where it is really the responsibility of the teacher to ensure that the student is getting what they need. Mm -hmm. And it was just an, it's just an impossibility. Well, that's a great word for it, impossibility, because I'm sure that's what this felt like to, to all of you in some ways. I am aware that education has had its high stressors way before the pandemic. Name just a few of those, kind of what, what you would see as being very difficult and then bang. I think one of the stressors for me is People who make education policy are not educators. Mm. So people at the Ouch. state government level, the federal government level to some degree, but more the state and the local level make policies that we're obligated to follow, but not all they aren't always funded properly. And we're not always given them the right people to make these things happen. And then we're held accountable for the results. Mm. So and then with the pandemic, you've got this added stressor that, you know, kids are behind because of all the things we just talked about. And yet there's this pressure that test scores should still be where they were. Mm -hmm. And we should still show the amount of growth that was would have been expected in a normal year when the last two years and this year haven't been normal at all. Mm -hmm. And yet we're still held to this accountability to have the test scores go up. And mm -hmm. it just feels like an impossible thing to make happen. Absolutely. And and what what the teachers see in that is they're trying to nurture these kids through this pandemic, this shared trauma that we've all been through. Because and most teachers get into the profession because of that interrelational right. dynamic, Absolutely. right? And so you want to help these kids deal with all that they've been through, whether their house was destroyed in a tornado or they're you know, someone in their family died from COVID. You're dealing with all of those things and you're trying to help them get back into school and learn how to be a learner again. The test scores just really are not the thing that we all think is important. And yet the pressure we feel mm -hmm. from above is mm -hmm. keep those test scores up. And so mm -hmm. it just feels like there's this disconnect between what you went into the profession for and what's being asked of you. Yeah, yeah. I'm fond of saying that every person ought to be a substitute teacher and drive a school bus mm. for a day. <laughs> they would be blown away at what that actually requires of a person. Mm. It's, it's far more difficult than people realize. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. um, and there have been significant shifts in society in terms of the respect for teachers since we were students. Very true. And so the, it is very, very difficult. Um, low pay, disrespect, the lack of ability to do what we have been very well prepared to do. It's also interesting that the, that the teaching profession is one of the most highly educated professions. Most teachers have master's degrees. Interesting. And yet we're not allowed to make decisions on our own. Most of it comes from above. And so there's just, there's all sorts of weird power dynamics that are happening in, mm. in the field that make it very, very stressful. And that's a governmental thing, but you're also getting, I'm assuming, lack of parent support at all time high as well, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I, I've seen it go both ways for the parent support. I've seen some parents pour into the schools more because of they see what's going on. And then there are some that have pulled away. <laughs> Uh, but it's nothing like when I was in grade school and the parent support, it was seemed like, seems like everyone was a room mom or something. It was really bizarre, but now, um, not that room moms are good or bad, but um, <laughs> <laughs> now it doesn't seem as if as many folks are as supportive as they are your public schools. And I don't know if it's the whole magnet school versus a community school versus a whatever but it seems like the support just isn't there anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we could go, I'm guessing, on and on about naming the, the problems and the difficulties and the impossibilities. Why are you guys still in this? <laughs> Why are you here? What, what, what makes you stay? Well, because I get to be with kids every day and watch them learn and I still, I've always felt like teaching was a calling for me. I felt like that was where, you know, I I come from a long line of teachers. Both my parents, mm -hmm. lots of my grandparents are all teachers. And I sort of ran from it, did not want to be a teacher, majored in like five things before I finally kind of realized, oh, this is where I'm supposed to be. Wow. But the first time I was in a classroom, in a class as like a teacher's aide in a college class, I just got this sense that this is where I'm meant to be. And so I feel like it's my purpose, it's my calling, and I can't I can't just walk away from that. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I love the school where I work. I, I feel very supported there for the most part. Um, I have great leadership. So it's not, um, it's not like every day feels hopeless. Okay. So you've got this sense of calling, and, and inerrant in that is staying true to the calling. So there's some loyalty or devotion, something there. What what helps you do that? What help helps me stay loyal? Yeah. I mean Well I I strongly believe in the vision and mission of my school. Um what you know our our vision is just to be a community of caring and lifelong learning. And that's all very cliche, but we really do wrap around kids in in lots of ways and try to make that happen. And so I still feel like I'm surrounded by a faculty full of people who believe in that same thing. And we really do whatever it takes to make sure okay. kids are learning so and you, loved. You're a team. You, Absolutely. You're not alone in it. Okay. Right. Do you, you guys experience that? There are days where there are <laughs> lots of tears <laughs> and there are definitely the moments where I'm ready to leave the profession. Mm -hmm. I'd be lying if I said there weren't. Thank you for your honesty. Um, <laughs> but for me, teaching is all about the relationship and the, as you mentioned earlier, there is this interconnectedness that happens in the classroom that is really meaningful. And there is something about watching the light. I taught first grade for a number of years and just something about watching the light come on in a kid's eyes when all of a sudden they realize that words have meaning and that they, it's absolutely delightful. And I don't know that you can replace it with anything. I tell my college students now that they're not all that much different than first graders <laughs> because people are people are people. And there is something that's just truly wonderful about coming alongside someone else and mentoring them through that process. That's what keeps me in the profession. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess I'm loyal to a fault in the sense that um, <laughs> I, I stay in the profession. I, I do. Yes. I want to see the light and I want to, what did you say, wrap around kids or whatever. <laughs> I don't know. All the feel good stuff. Whatever that is. But no, a uh, long time ago, I, I realized that I, 
I wanted to share my knowledge with others. I wanted other people to be as excited as I was originally as music, teaching music. Let me share some music stuff with you. And then it was computer. Let me share computer stuff. And now it's, let me share how to make these kids excited about this program, doing this online. And, and I, and I still get that when I have that opportunity to go into the classroom and work with teachers or work with students, um, that joy that I find in doing that still happens. Um, and I think that's what, that's part of what keeps me where I am. And uh, talking to a friend just last week, uh, she's a CEO of this really cool tech company, and she was saying how a lot of educational technology companies are uh, getting teachers as fast as they can just because they know at some point, they believe at some point that either it's going to shift so much that there's going to be so many tools online that the students need that they're going to need that personnel, or uh, teachers are going to realize how great of programs they have uh, mm -hmm. with these apps and things that they're going to move to using those apps in the schools. So they're going to go ahead and hire their people. Uh, and she was saying how teachers, or she was talking, she was in a meeting with other CEOs of ed tech companies, and they're just hiring teachers left and right now because teachers are wanting to flock the profession because all of them didn't come in for that wraparound feel good or seeing the light. and. A lot of them did, well, but the field has changed, yes. and their the fatigue factor is very real. Mm -hmm. Well, and part of that for me, because I've also thought about it, and I think part of it for me is when I spend large chunks of my time during my day doing things that I don't feel like can meet my purpose, mm -hmm. and one of those is testing. I, I am in charge of testing for my building, mm -hmm. and it's gotten to be this beast that takes over weeks and weeks of the school year. There's mm -hmm. like so much instructional time lost and so much stress put on kids and teachers mm -hmm. for the, the almighty test. And it, if when I have to spend day after day after day working on that, that's when I'm like, really I, this is not why I'm here. Mm -hmm. this, this is not why I'm here. I'm not here to, to give a big expensive test. Mm -hmm. um, but I think a lot of teachers feel that way when they're pushed to do things that they don't think is right for children. Mm -hmm. That's when they're like, I can't be a part of this. Okay, that's and, a better answer. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> so something sh kind of shuts down there. And uh, maybe over the last month or two, I've, I've talked to, to two relatively new teachers. Both of them s launched their profession within the pandemic, wow. and they are <laughs> done. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's for the similar reason. Something's really, really shutting down. So. You know, in a marriage, if you've got some money in the bank, emotionally speaking, some relational capita, you can go a long way. But if you start out right from the get-go where only your bowels <laughs> are what's keeping you together, things get really unraveling pretty quickly. What would you say to new young teachers who don't have the capita in the bank emotionally, yeah. these experiences of memorying when things light up, and it's just rubber hits the road hard. I tell new teachers, uh, the last couple of years I've been part of the new teacher induction, and I tell them, uh, you're going into teaching at a time that is completely different. Uh, my first year teaching was horrible. Your first year teaching is going to be extremely horrible. More so horrible. Just, yeah. <laughs> so just know that it's not you, and it's, I would say it's not the profession, but it could be. Uh, but I, that's what I tell them when I get up and talk. I say, I'm great, back me, blah, 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 blah. Your year is going to be horrible uh, by factors that you can't handle or factors that you can't control. Oh, just things good. that they cannot control is going to make their year they're already behind the eight ball, so to speak. So I encourage them to do anything they can to make sure that they keep their sanity and I encourage them to take a day off the first semester, which when I, when I said that, one of the supervisors looked at me and said, you can't tell them to take a day off. I was like, they have three personal days. If they want take to, they it. can, yes. Yeah. And um, just to be prepared to take care of themselves as well as those students during that first year because it's completely different and it may be horrible. I, I like to tell first year teachers, um, it gets easier. It never gets easy, but it gets easier. Mm -hmm. Because you get some things under your belt that you can start to do naturally. And then 
you can handle some of that other stuff. But um, one of the things I was going to say, mm -hmm. we'll let you ponder. Okay. Um, so I, I love what you were saying about it's, it's not your fault because any kind of stressful situation, if we can identify the problem, you know, if we're blaming ourselves or there's some kind of condemnation there, it's going to be worse. So kind of taking that off of, of people. That's really good. Um, I read an article in preparation for our time together that was saying, don't make it all about self-care because then you're putting teachers under another checklist and they're already, you know, working 50 plus hours well, the a thing week. With the self -care, and, that became such a buzzword during the pandemic because it was like, we, we can't really take any of this difficulty off your plate and we can't really give you any more paid time so we're gonna just tell you, you gotta take care of yourself because what you're doing is really hard. Like, if you really want us to take care of ourselves, give us more paid planning time. Give us less extra tasks other than teaching the kids. Okay. Those things So there's a more. systemic issue here um, that's coming top down and vote. I, I don't know, what are the answers to that part? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the answers? <laughs> uh, well, I... I what is it? Adam Grant doesn't like the term toxic positivity, but it seems like that's what it is. Hey, take care of yourself and make sure you get these files done by this time. And, and, and it's just, I, I think it's a part of what the leadership of the school, the district, the whatever, what they decide to give to a person. Because if they know that they're going to give someone a bunch of work or give them extra um, or, yeah, Figure out ways that you can shield them from some of that. Uh, when the pandemic first hit, one of the things I said I don't know, to somebody is that I hate that I'm not in a building anymore because I can't care for those teachers. Mm. Because I really wanted, I, as, as a building principal, I got to care for the teachers that were in my building and make sure that a lot of the stuff that rolled down from central office uh, didn't hit them uh, like it did in other schools. Man to have a leader who would <laughs> speak those words. Leadership I, does make a huge difference. Huge difference. I, bet. I, I can imagine that everybody would long for what he said right there. Um, that's big. So systemic and then what are some things maybe that has worked for you guys in terms of your own personal self-care? Because it feels like a double bind, right? But how have you tried to, to own that and make it yours? One thing for me, and this is what I was going to say about new teachers too, is I tell them, surround yourself with positive people that share your vision. Mm. Because there are always a few naysayers, there are always negative people, and they if they get your ear, it can really pull down a first year teacher or wow. even an early career teacher. So I tell them, you know, find the people that, that see this the way you see it and believe in it the way you believe in it and surround yourself with them and go to them when you have questions. And so I try to follow that as well. I kind of have my my people at school that I nice. that I go to to vent and to you know complain, and they help kind of bring me back. Mm -hmm. And the other thing for me, I, I sort of made it my goal this year to focus on joy, and mm -hmm. to I, my my favorite hashtag on um, what's it called Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Twitter is joy at school, mm -hmm. and so as often as possible, I look to find where kids are being joyful, where adults are being joyful, and, and highlight that because you find what you're looking for. That's and so if, if I go, th and, I, and I have to kind of tell myself to do that and remind myself to do that because like the other day when I was working on TCAP prep, I literally have a sweatshirt that says choose joy and I put it up on a chair so I could see it throughout the day because I needed to keep reminding myself. You needed the visual prompt. Yes, because sometimes it's easy to get dragged down, but if you're looking for those joyful moments, you're gonna you're gonna find them more. I love that. That's great. Beauty seeking, gratitude seeking, joy seeking. Any other tips? Well, I think it's very common in the profession that teachers are also lifelong learners. Mm. That that's a very common. Mm -hmm. I think you'll hear almost all of them say that. Um, and now is a time that requires us to continue learning. And there are lots of tools that can make virtual learning, hybrid learning, even just classroom learning, just because you put a computer in front of a kid does not mean you've helped them, right? So, yeah. but there are lots of ways in which we can improve our craft, make our lives more 
efficient. Like they, so, continue to seek those sources. Find people who are using different um, tools and learn them. Um, it. I don't think it's going to revert back to pre-pandemic mm -hmm. classroom. Mm -hmm. um, There's a dimension and there are some things that we have learned that have been positive from the mm -hmm. experience. Mm -hmm. um, but teaching of today is not teaching of yesterday and will change yet again in the future. So we've got to be sort of forward thinking in that way too. To I like that. That's a good word. And if they needed a resource for helping find some of those apps and strategies. <laughs> wow. uh, yes. <laughs> so uh, which kind of apps and strategies are we discussing this time? Uh, I, I actually go to Twitter and that's where I do most of my professional learning. Well, I say most, but now I'm in a doc program, so I guess most of it's coming from a bunch of books that I have to read. Uh, but uh, yeah, on Twitter, I've found a space where I can reach out to other tech teachers and tech directors across the country. As a matter of fact, started a Zoom group with those tech directors uh, just to talk about what's going on in their districts and how uh, that we can share ideas. Uh, they have chats or hashtags for new teachers and great information is put out there. Just the other day, a friend of mine uh, put out what five things you want every new teacher to know about technology? And since she's put it out, I don't know, hundreds have answered and given amazingly great ideas on things that new teachers could do with technology and in integrating technology. And a new teacher reached out today saying, hey, this is great. Thank you for this. Where can I find more information on this? And I said, follow her blog. And she's following her blog now. And so Twitter's where I go. But okay. I know there's other places. Who I knew? <laughs> All right, that's great. Anybody just have an inspirational word as we're kind of closing up on, you know, something that you would want to impart? Um, I, one thing I would love to say, since we are all people of faith, like how does your how does your faith, how does your relationship with God impact and play itself out in this context? So uh, I read this article several years ago, and it says people don't quit their jobs they quit their bosses so <laughs> maybe I shouldn't say that um, no it's, but it's one of those things where um, I think you just did um, <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter who my boss is I got to constantly remember uh, even if they do something that I don't like or whatever I, I still got to see them as a child of God mm. um, yeah and sometimes it's hard uh, to think, oh yeah, they're made in the image of God just like me, so get over it. <laughs> um, and I try to assume positive intent on the things that they're doing, mm -hmm. which oh, is sometimes difficult. Sometimes but. difficult, <laughs> but such a great principle. So principles of forgiving and yes. assuming good. Okay, what, what else? A lot of prayer. <laughs> just a lot of prayer. We, my... Uh, my principal prays over our school and our building and our classrooms at the beginning of every year. And um, we have a teacher-led prayer group that meets once a week and we we pray with each other and for each other. And those are the people I know I can go to and even though, you know, when I'm losing it and I, a lot of prayer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's good. And of course we're commanded to pray without ceasing. So that sounds like good advice. Yeah. What do you think, Amy? I think that though we have a calling to the profession, our calling is higher than that. Mm. And if it weren't for that higher calling, the calling to the profession wouldn't be worth it. Mm. Um, so it is in recognizing my relationship to my Heavenly Father and His authority over my life and His direction in terms of career <laughs> that um, that I do what I do. It, and without that it would it would be very impossible to do so mm -hmm. just sort of keeping those those things in proper alignment um, mm -hmm. is really beneficial yeah and I should totally say agree. on the other side of that we're not shaming anyone if they feel led to get out of the profession right I mean 
there could be all kinds of legitimate reasons to actually leave. Mm -hmm. But if you do want to stay, mm -hmm. <laughs> this is good advice. Mm -hmm. If you know you you think that that God has really moved in your heart to lead you to that place. Any other closing comments? A quote from Roosevelt or someone? I don't know. Ask good <laughs> questions, answer the ones you can, make someone feel special, and be great because you are great. Oh, one time more for the camera, please. <laughs> it's actually, it's something I used to say to my kids when I dropped them off at school. Yes. And then I started saying it to the kids at my school where I was principal. And one time my daughter heard me saying it. She was like, Dad, I thought that was for us. I was like, Oh, I know I felt bad. But, <laughs> uh, I would end every day or end every announcement with ask good questions, answer the ones you can, make someone feel special, and be great because you are great. Thank you guys for being here. <laughs>